Hi, my name is David Eagleman, and I'm talking about my new book, Incognito, here at the Hospital Club. I'm slightly daunted because this is one of those Renaissance people that you hear about. He doesn't just run a neuroscience lab at Baylor College of Medicine and write serious papers for the learned journals and you know, practice as an expert in things like synesthesia and the new science of neuro law. Um, but he writes critically acclaimed books. One of them, I think, has just gone into its 24th language. That's right. Some Tales from the Afterlife, which was so popular it's even been made into an opera by Brian Eno. Um, the last book you did was an iPad app. That's right. How to save the internet. Um, but I've been reading Incognito, um, David's new book about the brain, which is very accessible based on serious research. And I'm a bit jealous. <laughs> um, but I want to ask you as somebody who does the day job in the lab, real test subjects, and also thinks about it and philosophizes about it, how far along the journey of understanding the brain are we at the moment? <clears throat> well, neuroscience is really just in its infancy. Um, you know, one of, the big, one of the big questions in neuroscience has to do with how we have private subjective experience. So uh, as you know, and probably you guys know, the brain is the most complicated device we've ever found in the whole universe. It's made up of hundreds of billions of cells connected in, in the type of complexity that beggars the, the human imagination. And somehow that equals you, that equals your private subjective experience, all your hopes and dreams and aspirations. And the reason we know that is because if you get brain damage, even a little piece of brain damage, that completely changes you. Changes your capacity for decision making or your risk aversion, your ability to see colors or understand music, any of these things. So we know that this somehow, the integrity of this wet biological stuff is necessary for you to be you. But what we don't know is how you ever build private subjective experience out of pieces and parts. Because if you look at any cell, it's just a dumb cell. It's just doing its thing and trafficking proteins around and so on. And <clears throat> we, don't, we don't have a theory of how you build consciousness from physical pieces and parts. And we don't even know what a theory would look like. So what this tells me is we're really at the infancy of this field. I mean, essentially what we've discovered is this huge inner cosmos. Um, and we're just, it's probably roughly analogous to our place on the planet Earth looking out into the cosmos and just starting to understand the size of it, that there are a sextillion stars out there and probably lots of exoplanets with alien life forms and so on. When we look inside, that's the same challenge. We're peering into this inner cosmos that's hidden in this bunker of the skull and trying to figure out what the heck we're looking at. So one of the things we have learned is a lot of the mechanics is happening below the level of conscious awareness. Yeah, exactly. So that's what this book is about. Um, I, <clears throat> you know, if you look at something like, if you look at something like moving your arm, it, it seems so effortless. You just move your arm and there it is. But there's this whole lightning storm of, act, of neural activity that underpins a simple movement like that. And, you know, unless one were interested in neurobiology or something, you wouldn't even have any reason to suspect the existence of muscles and nerves and tendons and electrical activity because it just seems, it seems like it comes for free somehow, right? Um, so it's like, it would be like when you do a credit card transaction and it seems like that's just effortless, but that's only if you don't know about the international networking of server farms that live behind that, right? It's the same thing. And it turns out that every time you, you know, you lift some coffee to your lips or you drive or you recognize a friend or you fall in love, it feels totally effortless, and yet there's massive neural machinery going on under the hood, totally incognito. You don't know what's happening there. And the reason I wrote the book is because as I was you know, studying this over the years and really understanding the depth of this, I realized that the conscious me that was asking the questions is the smallest bit of what's happening in the brain. And um, you know, just about all of the brain's activity, you don't have access to. It's doing its own thing under the hood and, uh, and just serves something up to you once in a while. And you say, oh, I had an idea. But it wasn't you that had the idea. Your brain's been working on that for 
for days or weeks putting together information, consolidating things, finally serves it up when it's baked, and then you take credit for it. <laughs> so when we're born, are we blank slates? I mean, what does a baby know from the start? So babies don't come to the table as blank slates. Um, <clears throat> It's sort of like booting up a computer. You need a little bit of a kernel there to get things started. And then they boot up with, with some life experience. So it's always a combination of genetics and then all of the experiences you have. That's what boots you up. Um, but these programs, I mean, boy, there's something else that we've got a long way to go on. The Human Genome Project, you know, we've got all the base pairs sequenced. And that was a really important step in science. But boy, it's totally disappointing, right? I mean, it doesn't tell us anything about what we really want to know, which is, OK, now that we know all these letters, how in the world does that translate across all these levels to who we are and our fears and our joys and our hungers and our loves? Like, how does that all come together? Um, anyway, the genetics plus the experience wire up your brain in very particular ways. But again, most of that stuff you don't have access to. You don't know why you have the desires you do, the attractions you do. We just find ourselves with our conscious minds essentially with a tiny little summary on the top. The analogy I use in the book is that the <clears throat> Your conscious mind is like the headline of a newspaper because there's a lot of stuff that happens in a nation at any given moment, and you don't want to know that stuff. You don't care about how the sewage lines are taking away waste and how the cops are chasing criminals and how handshakes are securing business deals. You don't care about that. What you want to know is, what's, you know, give me the bottom line that I need to know. That's what a headline does for you. That's what your consciousness does for you. It says you don't need to know about the lightning storms of activity. I'm just going to tell you you're attracted to this person or you're scared of going to the dentist, or whatever it is. So evolution plays a strong role. I mean, you, you talk about the baby will recognize and warm to the shape of a face, even if yeah. it's not necessarily the parent's face. Right. And you also talk about in terms of sexual attractiveness. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is something that's always fascinated me. Uh, I read this study some years ago, and it just it seemed like such a perfect example. <clears throat> there was a study where men were shown photographs of women's faces and asked to rate the attractiveness. And unbeknownst to the men, um, it was the same set of women, and there was a, an experimental set and a control set of photos. The only difference was, in the experimental set, the women's eyes had been dilated with some neosinephrine. Okay. So their pupils were about two millimeters larger here than here. Well, none of the men picked up. I mean, they, the men didn't notice and say, oh, I noticed her pupils were larger. Uniformly, they were all more attracted to these photos here. They thought the women were more attractive here. Why? Because when a woman's eyes are dilated, that's a sign of sexual readiness. Well, the men's conscious minds didn't know that. There's no way they could have told you that. But boy, their brains picked up on it. And it drove them in the right direction. And that's how most of our lives go. We just get this feeling like, oh, I kind of like her. Right? There's the, anyway, all that, all that stuff's wired in there. Um, and, and I mean, it's part of your serious academic research, but you also study lap dancers. <laughs> no, no, that, <laughs> that wasn't me. But it was a very interesting study in New Mexico. Um, some of my colleagues at University of New Mexico studied strippers in a club um, <clears throat> to look at how uh, fertility cycles through the month influenced the amount of tips that they got. So they did this very scientifically. And they tracked both the experimental group who was off the pill and the uh, other strippers who were on the pill and found that the, the, your peak levels of fertility mapped on exactly with how much tips you got. And at other times of the month, they were getting very little and very high and so on. There are lots of unconscious cues that bodies pick up on about this stuff. Um, I mean, when you look at, if, let's say, baboons, they have very obvious signals, like a pink rump that you know, broadcasts it. Humans broadcast things too, but it's much more subtle. It has to do with skin tone, even the symmetry of the face, smells that are given off. All of these signals plug straight into the circuitry of the receiver without the person having any awareness of it. And I'll, you know, I'll just mention something else about it. I, I don't know. The, the, the part about attraction is only a little part of the book, but it seems like it's the Sorry. big part of our discussion. No, that's fine. Um, but I'll, just, I'll get to the, the hardcore science in a minute. <laughs> but I just want to mention, because it's interesting, is essentially all of the cues for attractiveness that plug right into these circuits are signs of fertility. This is true for both males and females. So you know, as, as males grow and become ready for mating, they get bigger chests and stubble and jaw. And so all these signs are the things that women find attractive. And as women mature sexually, those are the things that men find attractive. And it's um, things like hip to waist ratio, of course, is another sign of that. Because little girls don't have that, and, and women do. 
um, somebody did a study of purveyors of pornography through the decades, and even though the total weight has changed, it turns out the waist to hip ratio stays exactly the same, stays at 0.7 um, throughout the decades, because that's an optimal signature of fertility. Become a neuroscientist, you'll study lap dance and playboy <laughs> over the decade. <laughs> I'm only citing that literature, I didn't do that study. Now one of the things that surprised me through the book is so much of what goes into the brain and so much of the size of the brain, about a third of the brain, is devoted to vision. Yeah. It turns out that's why vision is so effortless. So you open your eyes and you see the world and you say, oh, there are the, these colors and the shapes. And this. The, reason, the only reason it's effortless is for exactly that credit card analogy. It's because of all this massive machinery living underneath it. And the reason that the reason that we sort of take vision for granted, as in, oh, that must be reality out there, is because we've never seen anything other than that. We're like fish in water trying to describe water. We have very poor capacity to describe it because we don't know anything else. But what's interesting for neuroscientists are visual illusions. Because, so these are, for some reason, these are like interesting to third graders and then to neuroscientists and no one in between. But, but the reason they're interesting to us is because it's like a bubble coming up in the water where you say, wait a minute, something's, something's wrong with reality. What I thought should be out there is not what my brain is telling me. And it turns out it's very easy to demonstrate all manner of ways in which we're not actually seeing what's, what's out there. Instead, your brain cooks up the best story of what it thinks is out there, and then it serves it up to you. And of course, you know that things like colors don't actually exist in the outside world. All we have is electromagnetic radiation of different wavelengths. These strike your retina. And, and sends a volley of electrical signals to the, to the back of the brain where the visual cortex is, and your brain constructs color. Why? Because color is essentially a way of, of tagging information. It's a way of you know, giving some immediate perceptual experience to, to information out there in the world, and it's very useful. I mean, if you want to spot you know, the ripe fruit in the trees from a distance, you want just an immediate perceptual experience of that. Um, but it doesn't actually exist, and so I do spend a chunk of the book asking this question about what exactly is reality? And a concept that I find fascinating is a concept that was introduced in 1908 and then promptly forgotten, which is the Umwelt. And um, this is the idea that every creature sees just a little tiny slice of what's going on out there. Um, so for us, we see this, um, you know, we see electromagnetic radiation, we call it light, we call it visible light. But if you look at the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, we're only seeing one ten billionth of it. The rest are things like cell phone signals and radio signals and television. That's all passing right through your body. It's completely invisible to you because you don't have the biological receptors for that part of the spectrum. That's as much of a part of reality as all this other stuff. It's just you don't get to see that because your umwelt is very restricted. Um, and of course, the umwelt is totally different for different creatures. So if you're a, a tick, it's butyric acid. If you're the electric ghost fish, then it's you know, electric fields and so on. Every animal is sort of picking up on different signals in the world. And the funny part is we all take whatever we pick up on to be objective reality. We think, oh, that's probably what the world really is. And it's only when we build little machines like a radio to pick up on other things we say, oh, that is this whole other thing. So you say the way we perceive vision has to be learned. What happens if you have a problem you can't see, you're blind? I mean, you, mm. you talk about Eric Weinemeyer, a climber. Yeah. Who's blind, who perceives through his tongue. He can taste on a device mm, That's it. right. It's because, okay, so um, this is actually quite an old science, and it's so amazing, and it kind of blows my mind that everybody's not talking about it every day on the streets. Um, this is called sensory substitution, and the idea is your brain, okay, so remember, your brain is encased in silence and darkness, right? It's not actually seeing light or hearing things, all it's ever getting is electrical signals coming in. So your eyes convert this little slice to electrical signals. Your eardrum and your inner ear convert sounds to electrical signals. Your fingertips convert it to electrical signals. All your brain ever sees is electrical signals, and it, it puts together this grand illusion for us. Um, so what some people started thinking about in the late 60s was, OK, well, let's say you've gone blind. You have no vision. Could we feed in visual information to you um, through a different channel, and your brain will figure it out because it's just electrical signals after all. And so this is the idea of sensory substitution. And the first one, the first attempt at it, was a camera that converts its visual input into little 
uh, electrodes on the small of your back. Why the small of your back? Because you're not using it for anything else, right? So, so you convert the visual input to this input here, and people can come to see. You know, you pass an edge, and they say, oh, yeah, oh, that's an edge. And they put a little circle, and they say, oh, yeah, it feels like a little circle. OK, so it got more sophisticated, and people started building these into glasses, a camera into the glasses. It was called the sonic glasses. And it converts the visual input into an audio stream. And at first, when you put these on and you walk around, it's just a cacophony. And as you move closer to things and farther, it makes different pitches and volume. And it sounds crazy, and you hit your shin on a table. But after about two weeks, you actually come to see. You have vision with this, with this audio input, which sounds insane, except keep in mind that all you're ever getting from your eyes is electrical signals anyway. The brain figures out if there are meaningful correlations with what you're feeling and hearing and so on, it figures out what the visual world must be, which, which again, it, it tells us that vision is a construction of the brain. So if it's electrical signals, I think you suggest in the book that at some stage we may plug data feeds directly into the brain. Exactly. So that's the future. I mean, it's maybe 30 years from now. Who knows? But yeah, there's no reason theoretically why you can't plug cables directly into the brain instead of the optic and the auditory cables and so on, plug in, you know, stock market data and weather data and other things and, and have a perception of that. Um, Facebook's already working on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, at minimum, you'd want to plug in infrared and ultraviolet. I mean, that's, you know, other animals get to see that part of the spectrum. It would be terrific if you had a perception of that also. Sometimes we make decisions without being aware of them that as a scientist, you can spot the data. And there are some phenomenal examples in the book of people choosing a partner based on having a similar name. Yeah, it turns out there's this whole field um, that falls under the category of implicit egotism, which is that people like things that remind them of themselves. And so it turns out that, yeah, you're statistically more likely to marry someone who's, whose first name begins with the same first letter as your own. So like Joe and Jenny are more likely to get married to each other. And you can verify this by going to any wedding registry, you know, county wedding, and, and you know, doing the stats on it. Um, so, you know, that's a terrible reason to choose a life partner, right? But, <laughs> but there it is. And if you asked some of their conscious narrative about how they chose their partner, they, that wouldn't be part of their narrative. Um, it turns out that if your name is Dennis or Denise, you're more likely to become a dentist, statistically. <laughs> it's a terrible reason to choose a career, um, but there it is. And there are lots of these. So yeah, if you're, if you're named Virginia, you're more likely to move to the state of Virginia in America, and so on. Um, there are lots of examples like this. It turns out that if you're holding a, a warm mug of coffee, you're more likely to describe your relationship with your mother as being close. And if you're holding something cold, then you'll describe your relationship as being farther apart. Right? Because it's this unconscious influence. It's not, it's not that it's getting it right. It's just that we've got all these different channels coming in, and they tell us different signals, and we don't always know why. So what is going on in the brain? I mean, we've got this clash between reason and emotion. There's a kind of battle going on every time we have to make a decision. Ah. So it turns out, <clears throat> so I'm putting forward a, a new framework in this book, which is that really the way to understand the brain is as a team of rivals, because what you really find when you reach your hands down in there is that there's not just one you. There are multiple yous. You've got all these neural subpopulations that are always battling it out for the single output channel of your behavior. You can only do one thing, right? So, uh, so imagine that you know, someone offers you a chocolate chip cookie. So part of you wants that because it's going to taste delicious. And part of you says, no, don't eat it. You'll get fat. Don't. And another part of you says, OK, you'll eat it, but you'll go to the gym tomorrow. OK, who's talking with whom exactly? <laughs> right? It's all you, but it's different parts of you. And it turns out that what's going on is there are, oh, your brain's like a parliament with different parties. And the reason I call it a team of rivals is because just like in political parties, people can have acrimoniously different ways of going about things, and yet they all love their country, right? They're all trying to do the best thing for their country. They just have different ways of going about it. Well, it's the same with your brain. So, um, yeah, so there it is. It, it turns out that uh, you know, we're always trying to navigate these, these battles. And who you are can sort of change from day to day based on how these battles are going, and based on whether you're fatigued or hungry or drunk or whatever it is. Um, one of the, so it turns out those battles can be broken down in a lot of ways, and there are different allegiances of the parties. One sort of broad stroke way of looking at it that even the ancient Greeks did was reason versus emotion. 
Um, the Greeks said life is like you're a charioteer and you're holding the black horse of passion and the white horse of reason and you're trying to stay in the middle of the road. And they pretty much had that right. And so with, with neuroimaging now, um, my colleagues and I give people tasks where you can, you know, sort of pit these things against each other and actually image what's happening in the brain and tease out these different networks. So reason and emotion is a big battle. Another one which is closely related is this issue of short term versus long term. It turns out that something offered to you right now has a lot of power, a lot of seductive power versus something that you have to wait for and it might even be bigger reward but it's later. Um, so you really get seduced by the now and it's, it's these parts of the brain battling it out. How can we learn to control those impulses? Can we yes. dominate how this thing works? Yeah, so um, I actually spent uh, uh, quite a bit in the book talking about this because I love this concept of a Ulysses contract. So, um, so you know, Ulysses was coming back from the, from the war, the Trojan War, and he realized he was going to pass Sirenum Scopuli, the island of the sirens, who sang such beautiful melodies that it, you know, beggared the minds of the sailors and they would crash their ships into the rock. Okay, Ulysses knew that like any mortal man, he was going to crash into the rocks too if he heard it. And so he, he came up with a plan to deal with his future self. He knew that his future self was going to behave badly. So he had his men lash him to the mast with ropes and put beeswax in their ears. And he said, no matter what I do, don't listen to me, just keep going. Right? And this way he was able to hear the siren song. And of course he went crazy and tried to stop them and they just kept sailing. Um, but the reason, so the reason that this is called the Ulysses contract is because it's a freely made decision where you are binding your future behavior. And this is a way that people can manage these battles between the short term and the long term. So there's a lot of examples of this. One, one that I find interesting and funny is the new proliferation of, of websites that, um, let's say you're trying to lose weight. You want to lose 10 pounds. So you go to the website and you give the website, these total strangers, you give them $100 and some date. You say, by this date, I want to lose 10 pounds. And it's just an honor system. But if you haven't lost the weight by that date, they keep the money. And they've got $5 million on the line right now of people doing this stuff because it's a terrific way. What it is is your present self is giving away money such that your future self will have to work really hard to get it back. That's the idea. So people come up with all kinds of clever ways to, to deal with short-term versus long-term temptation. Which is why banks do so well lending us money that we don't realize how much we're paying back. Well, yeah, that's right. Actually, so, um, yep, I, I make the argument that the subprime mortgage meltdown is really a neural phenomenon. If we want to understand this, it, these economic issues, we have to understand that what these lenders did is they plugged directly into the I want it now instant gratification circuits by saying, move into this house. It's bigger than you ever thought you could afford. Your friends and parents will be impressed. At some point, the adjustable rate mortgage will go up, but don't worry, that's way in the future. And people's brains aren't good at thinking about things distantly in the future. And so just by plugging right into those simple circuits, the whole economy got tanked. <laughs> there you go. Um, some of your work on time perception, um, I know you do some you know, heavy science on this. You came to London and talked to Coldplay about this recently, didn't you? That's right, that's right. Hey, um, tell us about that experiment. Well, that actually started, cause, so, so Brian Eno and I collaborated on uh, this thing we did at the Sydney Opera House for some, my last book. Um, and while we were there, he, he told me, so right, so about a third of my time in my lab, I study time perception. And he mentioned to me something about Larry Mullen, the drummer for U2, and he, how extraordinary his timing was. Because Larry came into Brian's studio and was listening to the click track and said, there's something off. And Eno said, no, there's not. And Larry said, yeah, it's off. And they got in an argument. And finally, finally, Eno said, all right, look, I'll, just, I'll adjust it to shut you up. And he adjusted. And then after Larry left, he realized that he was exactly right, that there was something off, and that he had a and Larry had gotten it exactly right. So Brian told me that story and I thought, I thought, well, you know, every time we study anything in neuroscience, what you really want to find is who's the best people to plan it at it? Because that's where you can really clearly figure out what's going on in the brain. If you're studying someone who's kind of terrible at time perception, it's harder to find stuff. So, um, so what I did in December is I got all my this portable EEG equipment and all my computers and stuff and, uh, and I flew out here to London and, and set up at Brian's studio. We got in a bunch of, we got in Will Champion from Coldplay 
and a bunch of other very talented drummers. And, uh, and I tested them all day and uh, had them do these timing tasks and put on EEG. It was hard to get through the, uh, the airport security with all that funny equipment, but I got through and made well, it. What did you learn, David? Um, well, I learned that drummers have better timing than control subjects. But the important part is, um, is the EEG data, which we're, we're, now, we're right now running this on control subjects now, so that we can really understand the difference in what the drummers are doing brain-wise that make them better than control subjects. You know, what part of their brains are involved and how they're making these computations. So what are you doing day by day in the lab? So my time's essentially split between time perception, something called synesthesia. How many people know what synesthesia is? I'm just curious. Ah, OK. Um, it's a blending of the senses. So uh, people with synesthesia might hear music, and it causes them to see colors physically. They're seeing colors. Or they might hear something, and it puts a taste in their mouth, an actual physiologic phenomenon. Or they taste something, and it puts a feeling on their fingertips. And they're not being metaphoric or poetic or artistic or on drugs. It's an actual cross-wiring in their brain that causes activity of one sense to kindle activity somewhere else in the brain. And um, so in my lab, we're pulling the gene for synesthesia. We're doing neuroimaging. We've just submitted a paper where we've analyzed over 19,000 synesthetes um, in rigorous detail. So we're really pushing that field forward because synesthesia is such a terrific inroad into how brains operate. And the part that appeals to me about it is this thing I said about how we're like fish in water. What it teaches us is that with just a very tiny genetic change, you can have a totally different view of reality than your neighbor. Both parties take this to be objective reality, but they're actually quite different. And synesthesia is one of our few inroads into understanding that. The third thing I do in the lab is um, the initiative on neuroscience and law. So I, I direct this initiative that tries to understand how modern neuroscience affects the way that we think about the legal system and think about criminal blameworthiness and punishment and new ideas for rehabilitation. And if I were going to summarize it in a sentence or two, it's just that um, you know, currently the legal system treats incarceration as a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, but we have so much more data, we could actually be much more nuanced, have customized sentencing, customized rehabilitation, set up structures better for incentivizing pro-social behavior on a societal level. Um, there's a lot of things we can do. It's actually more just and humane, but it's also more cost effective because prison, um, as everyone probably knows, or at least intuits, is a, is a revolving door. And when you put people in prison, it's criminogenic. It actually makes people more likely to be criminals and come back. So um, there are many more nuanced things we can do given what we know in neuroscience. And that's what I'm really trying to make a change in there. And is there a particular type of biology that leads people to end up in jail? There are so many different things that can lead people there. To, to have pro-social behavior actually requires a lot of really, you know, a lot of cylinders firing at once. Um, if you have a poor capacity to simulate future consequences, or you have poor impulse control, or a poor understanding of the rules, or, or a lousy social context, or in utero cocaine poisoning, or you know, a, a thousand things I could list, these are all things that can lead you there. Um, and, and the key thing is, because there are lots of things that can lead you there, there's lots of clever things that we can do to, to, to route people appropriately. Incarceration is appropriate for some people. If their brains are working fine, then it serves as a deterrence and a behavioral modifier. But it doesn't work for, I mean, our prisons have become our de facto mental health care systems in some cases. And are the authorities listening? I, I just got invited by the government of New Zealand to speak to their Ministry of Justice. And New Zealand, of course, is more nimble than the battleship of America. So you know, maybe there'll be some effect there. I'm trying to really make things known uh, to governments in America and England. And we'll see if anyone listens. I think the reason they'll listen in the end is because it's more cost effective. Another thing you've been doing in all the spare time that you have, um, you've invented another religion, haven't you? <laughs> Possibilianism. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of possibilianism? OK. You'll be converts within the <laughs> <laughs> So I have a friend at Facebook who's tracking the number of people who've changed their religious status to possibilian. Um, and it's, you know, it's in the thousands. So it's getting there. So you're but, leading a cult. Well, that's the thing. I'm not leading it. It's, a, <laughs> it's really a grassroots tell, thing. Tell us what possibilianism is. Possibilianism is this. Um, it's essentially the scientific, what I see as the scientific approach to the bigger question. So it turns out that you know, science is the, it's the most successful endeavor we've ever 
had. It's taught us so much. We've tripled lifespans. We've gotten men to the moon. We've invented the internet. It's terrific. But when you get to the end of the pier of everything we know in science, you know, you realize that past the end of that pier, it's all uncharted waters, right? The amount we don't know so vastly outstrips what we do know. Um, and so what that calls for is some intellectual humility. And the funny part is the last decade has been characterized by these arguments between the strict atheists and the fundamentally religious. And they're both pretending they know what's going on. And neither one has enough evidence to really know. Um, and so uh, and by strict atheist, I mean, I mean the type who say, we've got it all figured out. F equals ma equals mc squared. We've got this cosmos. I mean, you know, they're pretending that they know, whereas in fact, so much of what's going on in the cosmos we don't know. 96% of the matter of the cosmos is dark matter or dark energy. We don't know what that is. That's a lot to slip under the rug and act like it's a fudge factor. <laughs> um, and of course, the, the religious, you know, they're very important books written by the atheists. That, that, you know, it's like shooting fish in a barrel over here. I mean, you know, there are 2,000 religions, um, and they're all mutually exclusive. And, Anyway, I'm not going to go into the, the details there, but the point is that I found myself somewhere in the middle. And by middle, I didn't mean, OK, well, is there the guy with the beard on the cloud, or is there nothing at all? I thought, instead, why not explore different possibilities and be a possibilian and think about the structure of the possibility space and all of the things that aren't getting discussed in what I think is probably a false dichotomy. There's either a deity or there's nothing at all. I mean, maybe, you know, there's 100 million stories we can make up that are so much more interesting than that. So, um, so possibilityism specifically does not subscribe to any particular story. And there is no church or leader of possibilityism. Uh, but the idea is that it takes on the scientific temperament of creativity, of coming up with new ideas, and tolerance for multiple hypotheses. Because that's all we ever do in the laboratory. We, you know, to make progress, the textbooks are sort of bullshit, right? Because they always imply that science proceeds in a lockstep process. It never does. Every major thing that's happened in science is somebody coming up with some creative leap, and then you look back and see if you can build a bridge to the land where you came from. Sometimes you can, most of the time you can't. And, and if you don't have any evidence to bring to bear on it one way or the other, you hold it as a hypothesis. And so science is really tolerant of saying, okay, well, it's maybe any of these things. You might favor one over the other, but you're willing to hold on to different stories. That's possibilityism. You can still get Easter eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. There's only one ritual for converting to possibilityism, that is changing your Facebook status. So <laughs> let me know. <laughs> so you, you do all this physical research in the MRI machine, scanning the mechanics of what's going on. You do a lot of thinking about the philosophy of what's going on. Yeah. Where do you stand on? How far we as individuals are determined by what's physical? You know, is there a soul? Mm. So there's clearly something like a soul, but depending on what we mean by it. So there's clearly an essence that people have. And this is what we miss about people when they die. Um, there's something that we really care about that person. And I think we could all agree that that's sort of what we mean when we talk about somebody's soul. Now, whether there's something extra physical that's going on, we just don't know. I mean, one of the issues that I tackle in the book uh, very briefly is this issue of, OK, is there free will or not? I've studied this question essentially my whole life now. And I've concluded that there's no way to actually make a definitive statement on it. So actually, it divides into the same camps. Some of these guys over here will say, absolutely, free will is an illusion. We don't have any. OK, well, they don't actually know that for certain. Um, and the religious folks will insist we do have it. Uh, and again, we don't know that for certain. Um, what seems clear to me is that we are so dependent on this biological machinery. And when it changes, not just by brain damage, but you know, people universally administer alcohol and nicotine and drugs of all sorts to spike their chemical cocktails to change themselves in various ways. Um, it's so clear that we are somehow dependent on this biology that what it seems to me is if free will exists, which it might, uh, the unfortunate part is that it's kind of a bit player in the giant, colossal operating system of the brain. Um, most of what you do and believe and so on has come to you from the genetics you've come to the table with, intertwined with every one of your experiences. That makes up most of what you are. Um, maybe we do have choice, but it's not, it's not the major player. And so when someone looks at a, at a lawbreaker and says, well, I wouldn't have done that, so he should be punished. Uh, you know, we should really get our bloodlust slaked here. The issue is, if you didn't have the exact same genes and history and childhood abuse and whatever else that that guy's, you don't have the same brain. I mean, brains are like fingerprints. 
they're, they're all kind of different from one another. And so the intuition that the legal system has is, okay, well, he just used his free will to make a bad choice, and I use my free will to make good choices. But it's not, it's not that simple, actually. Um, I want to take questions from the audience in a, a second. I just want to ask you, if we're still at this early stage of unraveling the possibilities of understanding the brain, do we have the tools to do that? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, <clears throat> as I mentioned at the beginning, we don't, we don't have the mathematical tools to say how you ever build subjective experience. I mean, you can't say, okay, well, I'm going to do a double integral and carry the three, and then that equals the, you know, the redness of red or the feeling of pain. There's no way, there's no way to translate those languages. And so what we don't know right now is, you know, like, is the city of London conscious? Right, because it's got lots of pieces and parts interacting. It's got billions of pieces and parts interacting: cell phones, handshakes, electricity lines. Does that? Does having a lot of pieces and parts make something conscious? We just, gosh, we don't even know. We're really at the foot of the mountain on that one. Yeah, but all we have at the moment are MRI scanners and EEG scanners. And yeah, we've got a lot of tools, and it's really fancy machinery, and it's still quite crude. Um, you know, with MRI, which is sort of our fanciest thing around. Um, we're still imaging what are pretty big chunks of the brain that contain hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons in them. Um, a lot of types of signals are totally invisible to fMRI. This is a type of neuroimaging. Um, and so, you know, all the way at one end of the spectrum, we use electrophysiology to measure single cells in the brain. At the other end of the spectrum, we use neuroimaging to measure chunks of cells. But there's this huge sweet spot in the middle where we just don't have technology to measure what, let's say, 100,000 cells are doing at once. And that's where all the action is, where you have these patterns riding on top of these seas of neurons. Yeah, we, we don't and have we're we relying too much on these very brightly colored neuroimages. We're told that they can tell us what products we want to buy, what films we prefer. Um, we're relying on them to the extent that they're the only things we have. And so if you lived 105 years ago where there were only x-rays, you would do the best you can with x-rays and figure out what you can. And that's what we're in the middle of doing right now. Um, and there are large things going on in the brain that do tell us quite a bit. Um, the, the analogy that I use is if you were a, 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 an astronaut in the space shuttle looking down on the country, you can't see any of the details. You can see if there's a giant forest fire. You can't see if people are happy or if there's a virus or if the economy's crashing. You just can't see that from that distance. That's what we're like with neuroimaging. We can see big forest fires, and sometimes that's useful. We just know that there's a lot in the microcircuitry that is invisible to us. Questions for David? Hi, um, thanks for that. What do you mean, or if you mean anything, by soul or essence? Well, as I said, I, I mean, I think of it as the, well, as I said, it's like what you miss when somebody goes away and you think, oh, I just, that was the thing about that person. What I'm talking about really is a, an external interpretation of that person rather than what I think uh, someone might mean if they believed in the extra physical, that kind of soul that outlasts your corporeal self. Um, so I think we'd all agree that there's something really special about people and lives and so on. The question that's an outstanding one, and I'm not pretending to know the answer here, is is that equivalent to the activity of the brain? It may well be. We just don't know that one way or the other. The other half of the question is, could it be something else? And in the, I'll just mention this. In the last chapter of the book, I, I emphasize in the possibility and spirit that even though most neuroscientists are reductionists, meaning we think that if we take it all the way down to the, you know, the systems and the neurons and the molecules inside the neurons, that that will be sufficient to understand everything about human lives. Um, I mentioned at the end that there are other possibilities. And so I just make one up. And I'm not saying this is true, but I'm just saying it's equally as consistent with the data. And here's the made-up possibility. <clears throat> Let's say you were a, a bushman in the Kalahari, and you found a radio in the sand. So you would notice that the radio speaks voices and has these things, right? So you start exploring it. If you pull out a wire, you realize that the voices get garbled, or they stop entirely. So you put the wires back in, and you realize that it's, So you wouldn't have any reason to imagine the existence of distant cities with radio towers and electromagnetic radiation, right? So you would become a radio reductionist. And you'd say, well, somehow, if I hook this up in the right way, it produces voices. 
Well, that's where we are as neuroscientists, right? You say, well, if we hook all these wires up in the right, somehow you get consciousness. But we don't know. Maybe there's some equivalent of electromagnetic magnetic radiation. We're like the radio receivers. Now, please don't cite me on this and say, oh, Eagleman said that's true. I'm just saying that there are lots of things on the table that could be true. So we can't go in, even though day to day we go in the lab and, and act as materialists and reductionists, we can't know for sure that's true. I think you had your hand up next. For, for many years, people have debated about whether there's a left side and a right side, a rational and a creative. Yet places like Columbia University do MRI scans on jazz musicians that show the entire brain is sparking at the same time. What's your view on that? It's the entire brain. There's a little bit of difference between the left and the right, but it turns out there's more similarity than difference between the hemispheres. Um, the <clears throat> for almost everybody, the left tends to be involved in language, um, and fine motor skills and stuff, and the right's involved in more abstract things. But, but it's more like a ratio between the two rather than an all or none. Yeah, thanks for that question. Do you think that in the next two, three decades, we'll see machines that are replicating activity similar to our brain activity? So the, so decision making all sorts of stuff. So the question is about will we be able to build machines that somehow replicate our brain activity? Um, I can tell you this, artificial intelligence, AI, is a failed field. So um, when I was growing up, this is probably true for many of us here, when I was growing up, I thought by 2011, we would have robots like C-3PO who are serving us coffee and whatever. Forget it. Like the smartest robot we have is the Roomba vacuum cleaner, right? <laughs> so something went really wrong. And, and it turns out what went wrong is it's a really hard problem. And so the only way we're going to solve this is by figuring out what Mother Nature actually did, by figuring out the tricks that she got to implement over billions of years with trillions of experiments in parallel. That's the only way we're going to get it. And so I think that, so what I propose in the book is this team of rivals framework where the way the brain actually runs is on conflict, where you have multiple things that all think they know the answer and they fight it out. And I propose that that's the solution to the logjam in artificial intelligence, is to build machines predicated on the the principles that Mother Nature does. Um, so, but prediction is difficult, especially of the future, as they say. And so I don't know if it'll be the next couple of decades that we'll get there. But right now, it's, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't been impressive. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a techno optimist in general. I am. It's just, it's impossible. There might be some guy in a basement in Russia who's just like solved the problem, or it might be 500 years from now. We just don't know when it's going to happen. Um, hello. Um, I suffer from. Partial seizures at the temporal lobe. Mm. Um, a, a, a very mild, admittedly, a form of epilepsy. Um, but I have things like, when I have a seizure, I suffer from things like deja vu, <coughs> extreme sense of deja vu, funny taste in my mouth, um, je, je, je me vu, je me vu, the um, experience where you, you don't recognize someone you've known, you know for years. Yeah. Um, how, how do you explain, how do you explain that? Well, that's one example of a thousand good examples that tells us that we depend on our biology. And as soon as you get the things firing out of, uh, out of their normal patterns, then things that we take so for granted, like, oh, this is my loved one, or you know, this, I, this is familiar to me, or not, very basic things can, can go awry. And it's, you know, unfortunately, most of what we know about the brain comes about from nature's experiments these, these out-of-the-lab experiments that we see with traumatic brain injury or degenerative disorders or epilepsy or any type of thing that tell us, my god, the most basic thing, like take using a mirror. Some colleagues of mine recently showed that with particular kinds of brain damage, you, you lose how you don't understand what a mirror is and you try to reach through it. Or there's a brain damage you can get where you, you stop doing involuntary breathing and the only way you can breathe is by doing it voluntarily. You have to remember to breathe or you can lose the ability to understand music, or you know, I could list things all day long. And that's what teaches us that it's a very delicate, fragile system. That's why nature has you know, built this armored bunker around it, right? It's like this thick skull plating because she really needs to protect this magical, pink, delicate stuff. Anyway, that's, that's, what, that's what it illustrates for us. You mentioned in the book, Phineas Gage, who was the victim of a railway accident and lost a large part of his brain, thought he was fine, lived as normal, but all his friends said, a completely different person. Yeah, exactly. That, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old medical case from about 120 years ago now. 
And the reason it became a famous case is because this, this iron tamping rod, it blew through his head with an explosion, and it clattered to the ground 50 yards away. The reason it became a famous case is because he didn't die. He didn't even lose consciousness. Um, the first physician who showed up to the scene didn't even believe him what had happened until, until Phineas Gage bent over and coughed, and a teaspoonful of brain fell out on the ground. And then the physician believed what had happened. But, but yes, that's exactly the result, is that he completely changed in personality. He was just, he, you know, he took to cussing and sleeping with prostitutes and just he had a totally different personality. Well, this is what happens when you get, it's called frontal disinhibition. When you lose your frontal lobes, which is essentially the engine of socialization, you did all these things lurking under the surface come to, uh, yeah, this is what happens when we train children, when we say, no, you can't shoplift that or you can't urinate in public or something. That's what we're doing is we're training up their frontal lobes to suppress in exactly this team of rivals kind of way to suppress these other drives that they have. And when people you know, near the end of their lives get frontotemporal dementia, where it's a, de it's a degenerative disorder where you lose your frontal lobes, all that stuff comes back out. And they urinate in public, and they expose themselves, and they shoplift. They do whatever they want. And their embarrassed adult children have to explain to the judge, look, I'm sorry, but my mother has frontotemporal dementia. It's not, she's not choosing to do this with her free will. It's that these other systems in the brain have been unmasked. They're no longer fenced in by the frontal lobes. You should take your scanning machines to Millwall Football Club, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, question over here. Um, yeah, so my question is about, you're, you're talking about what happens when our brain, parts of our brain don't work. But what about, if you want to go the other way, you talk about genetics and about our experiences. But what about, for example, meditation and all these studies that have come out where there are these parts of our brain that um, what happens with meditation, your brain is essentially always doing two things. It's monitoring its internal world, and it's also monitoring the outside world. And with meditation, you're, you're tipping that balance so that you're really, you're more internal. Um, and so when people are meditating and in the scanner, you know, if you do something like that, it just, it doesn't get very far in the system if they're, if they're really in the zone. Whereas normally if you do that, you know, the brain orients and cares about it and so on. Um, there's a colleague of mine in Germany who's been suggesting that the school system should make meditation classes mandatory for elementary school students because now more than ever, everybody's trying to get your attention with advertising and bling and screens and so on. And he feels like this is a really necessary skill for children to be able to turn that off and look inward a bit. So it's not like you're getting any magical new stuff in the brain. You're just you're shifting the balance of where you're looking. Question from this side. Um, a number of uh, people are talking about the fact that we have central nervous systems and, for instance, you have a huge number of nerve bundles in your stomach and, and, and other parts God. of your body. And I wonder what your view is of how much that constitutes and contributes towards who we are and our consciousness. It's a great question. Um, it illustrates a couple things, right? So you've got about 100 billion neurons that are controlling your gut, the peristalsis in your gut. You don't have any access to that kind of stuff, but that's just, you know, you don't have access to most of it. Okay, but the thing is, um, uh, some people ask me sometimes about, let's say, uh, Buddhist monks who can slow down or speed up their heart rate or, or change the blood flow to one arm or the other to make it hotter or colder. That's terrific. They're getting more depth. They're getting more conscious intrusion lower down. But I actually think they're just tickling the surface. Most of what's going on in the gut is a good example of that. Is totally outside your control. Um, and so when people can get more conscious control, that's terrific. But it's really just a little tiny bit. There's this huge gap between, your, between what your brain knows and what your conscious mind can ever know. By the way, if we have one second, I just want to do this demonstration because I think this is so funny. OK, this, here's the participatory part. Because um, it, it illustrates how, how little access you even have to what your brain knows. OK, so I'd like everyone to grip your steering wheel. OK, and what I'd like you to do is make a lane change into your left lane. So you're driving your car, and you're moving one lane over to your left lane. So go ahead and move your steering wheel so that you're moving into the left lane. OK, OK, so it's pretty, it's pretty easy, right? You did this and then this. OK, so everybody I saw got it completely wrong. If you did that, you'd actually go off and onto the sidewalk. The way to make a lane change is you do this, come back to center, all the way to the other side, equally as far, and then back to center. That's how a lane change works. And you do that effortlessly in your car all the time, but you don't even know how you do it. And when you think about it, you're not even able to access it, right? So what this, this is. This is just one example of 100 I have in the book about 
ways that you can do, your body can do all kinds of things that you don't even know. You, yeah, I think people's <laughs> unconscious is drawing them to that pile of books that Canongate has, <laughs> has kindly put out at the back for you to sign, breaching your embargo of not being published till tomorrow. That's right. This is the very first, the worldwide first here. So I'm just going to thank David. Thank you, David. The Hospital Club and Canongate and our audience um, for a very stimulating evening. Thank you, David. Thank you, David.